As always, it is wonderful to be back with people that you love and familiar faces that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us together in this dunya and most importantly to be together in the barzakh in the intermediary realm and on Yom Al Qiyamah and insha'Allah ta'ala and in paradise at the highest levels at that point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa naza'na ma fi qulubi min ghil and that where Allah ta'ala removes any type of ghil which is actually in his introduction I just noticed here uh, where he removes all types of rancor and anything that anyone would ever have in his heart for that any other person ikhwanan ala sururin mutaqabilin they are brothers on couches facing one another and just think about the purity of what is experienced from the blessings of brotherhood and the blessings of sisterhood in the hereafter and that everything that is that one experiences Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this opportunity and really in a time where there's so many people that are so lonely and there's so many people that have reached the point of despair don't have anyone to take care of them and if anyone's ever seen an old folks home or visited one and to see how so many people end up towards the end of their lives to have people uh, there's a bit of feedback there is that because and to see that is a real eye-opener and you, we have to really be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything that is that we have and all of our blessings. And one of those greatest blessings of all is the blessing of companionship. And subhanAllah, I think we've all learned that in this past year or so. What happens when you're not able to be around people as you normally would, when you're not able to maintain relationships and visit one another as you normally would. Should I just leave this aside? It's great to keep back. <clears throat> and we've all learned how much we actually need those interactions. And sometimes they might think like they're very normal or even mundane. What happens kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, just receiving a text from a friend, calling some, whatever it might be. But then all of a sudden you're deprived of that. And then you start to see the repercussions after. And so this is really one of the most important things of all and one of the great blessings of all is that we have a concept of brotherhood. And as we will be reading today, and again we're going to take what we can from this blessed book of the Ihya, as we will be reading, the standard is extremely, extremely high. And someone might argue that there's no reason even mentioning that high of a standard if there's no way that you can possibly attain it. And I would put forth that actually it's helpful to know what's out there, to know what people achieved in a very real sense previously, so that we can know where we're at in relation to it and do what it is that we can. So just because we'll be mentioning the lofty standards that Imam Ghazali is putting forth for what it really means to have brotherhood with someone or sisterhood with someone and to love each other for Allah to Allah Qutada's sake. That's an extremely high standard. But it doesn't mean that we just neglect it completely because we can't attain that highest standard. We do what it is that we can. And we inch in that direction and try to do what is, is facilitated for us. And that really if I kind of take it back, this was also by suggestion that we do this particular book. And as our dear beloved Sidi Mahdi said, I do love the Ihya al It is uh, a passion that I have to read this blessed work. And it is a work that does bring your heart to life. And that one of the secrets, as he pointed to, was Imam al-Ghazali was a person who internalized these meanings. And there's this beautiful, and this is the good thing about California, you can talk about things that you can't talk about in other places because the hearts receive it. There's this beautiful section in Ibriz where that, uh, the student of Sidi Abdul Aziz at the Bagh, Sidi Ahmed bin Mubarak, he was critical of something Imam Ghazali said, and I believe it was in the context of what he said about the best of all possible worlds. And he was very critical of Imam Ghazali, and it reached to the point where 
he was almost attacking his person as opposed to the, his position. And there's a difference. And when Sidi Abdul Aziz, being a person of inner sight, perceived this, he stopped him. And he says, Imam al Ghazali is a great Qutb. He's one of the greatest of the awliya. And from the Barzakh, he visits me regularly and asks me questions. Yani, indicating that this is someone who's very special. And there are even those, like it mentions, as Habib Ahmed Zain Habshi mentions in his commentary of the Sharh al Aniya of Imam Haddad's work. He says is that even though he wasn't from Ahl Bayt, and this is in rare exception, the very few that have that assume the maqam of al Qutbi al Kubra from other than Ahl Bayt do it ultimately, not even Ahl Bayt, that on behalf of the family of the Prophet, but there are few in Imam al Ghazali was one of them, he held the position for three days. So Imam al Ghazali is one of these people who internalize this knowledge. And one of the most important books of all that we can read and reread and reread time and time again, several times throughout our life, and that we should encourage teenagers and people as they mature and get into their early 20s as well to read is the book Al Munqid Min Al Dalal. And the most accessible translation we have until there's another option is R.J. McCarthy's translation, which is titled Al Ghazali's Path to Sufism. This is a really beneficial book where Imam Ghazali talks about his experience and it's an autobiography where he explains what it is that he went through, what it is that transpired in his life and how he went through his two famous crises was brought out of them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first being that a more existential crisis and then it was a light that Allah placed in his heart that brought him out of that and the second was a spiritual crisis that again Allah forced him to be in a state of what is called iltirar, and he actually quotes the verse, and then Allah brings him out of this state for, as a bounty from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he then goes on to say um, that what he realized of all of the ways to come to know, any way that you can come to know, whether it be through philosophy or whether it be through theology or that whatever it may be, he found the best way to truly come to know was to tread a path of drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by putting the knowledge of the sacred law into practice and then the veil that is lifted as a result in other words the science of ihsan is that this is the best way to truly come to know reality as it is and so when he writes this book he is writing this book from a heart that is alive. And here we are, 950 roughly years later, benefiting from his scholarship. And this is a great blessing. And to even have these windows into the souls of these individuals. Because if you think about it, every single, the way that we would write, that we think about a meaning and then we put pen to paper, or now that fingertips to keys, and then the words come out. But what was our state when we were writing. If we're facing the Qibla, it's going to be different than if we're not facing the Qibla. If we're in a state of wudu, it's going to be in a better state if we're not in a state of wudu. If we are a person of dhikr, is that our fikr is going to be munawwar. If we remember Allah more, when we write, there's going, the words are going to be illuminated. If we are people who put our knowledge into practice, the words that emanate are going to be different, and so forth and so on. In other words, is that how our heart is and the state of our very heart will determine how the words that emanate from our heart are received. And so, reading a text like this from such a great author and such a pious person has tremendous benefit. And what a better place to do it amongst the people that you love and that you hope there is some degree of these realities present in a very real way that we can then seek the fruits of them MashaAllah, tabarak wa ta'ala, as long as we are alive here in this world, and then most importantly in the next. So having said that, um, we only really have two sessions, and so we're not going to be able to cover the entire book, but I still think that we can cover the main themes of the book. And um, I wanted to start right off the bat with this introduction, and then briefly walk us through the various chapters of this work. So we can understand the scope of what Imam al-Ghazali is trying to treat in his discussion on brotherhood. 
So there is a translation of part of the book. Most of you, many of you might have seen it. It's uh, that, uh, that translated by Mukhtar Holland, rahimahullah ta'ala, and published by the Islamic Foundation. But really he only translates one of the chapters of the whole book. And he focuses on uh, the actual duties, and thus it's, it's called the duties of brotherhood in Islam. So he doesn't uh, translate most of the other chapters. He focuses on that one, which is beneficial. And we were going to be covering this in the second session today, Bidni uh, Laitara. But it is worth really looking at the title itself of this book. Um, because we, we think of this book of the Ahya um, only in the sense of, uh, we think of it only in the sense of duty of brotherhood, but actually the intention behind Imam Ghazali was that it be more vast than that. And this is the fifth book of the second quarter of the Ahya. So you all are probably all familiar with what that means by now. The Ahya is divided into four quarters, and the second quarter is the quarter on Adat. And it's a very difficult word to translate, and customs doesn't really that convey the meaning as you would want it to. But the meaning of adat comes from adi'udu, something you return to. So these are things that are part and parcel of life, things that we are doing in relation to other people. So you could say it relates to our interpersonal relationships or our dealings, our interactions with people. And so this is the fifth book in this quarter. And the title that Imam Ghazali gave it was Kitabu Adab al Suhbati. So this is the book on the Adab, the plural Adab. And again, this is a very important word. And it's better probably just to leave it as it is. But it can be translated as manners, proprieties, etiquettes, however you choose. So the, on the etiquettes or the proprieties of suhbah, which is companionship, wal and brotherhood. And why would someone use a word suhbah and then ukhuwa when they seem to be synonyms? There might be people that you have very strong ukhuwa with, brotherhood, but you rarely see them. You could have a brother on the other side of the world that you might only see twice a year, or once a year, or once every five years. But your ukhuwa, your brotherhood with that brother, is benefiting you on a daily basis, in a very real way, much more than the people that you have suhba with, companionship of, and that you are actually interacting with on a daily basis. From the blessing of the bond. And look at the beauty here of how the vision of Islam is and what we're taught about the realities of this deen. All of these, the merit that we will soon hear about establishing a brotherhood with another person and loving people for Allah to barakatah sake, distance does not harm that, nor does death. Distance nor death cannot separate you from the benefits of that relationship no matter where they are on the face of this earth. And you'll benefit in the moment, in, in every moment, that the reality of that is there. And there are people that have even, by way of karama, have had such a close bond, where you hear ajaib of wonders. But the purpose of this story is just to mention what is possible, where there are stories where people have such a close connection where even in a physical sense, someone does something in one part of the world and someone else might feel the effects of that in another part of the world. And it might be something as mundane as even eating, where someone eats with the intention of that benefiting his brother and someone on the other side of the earth benefits from that even though he didn't physically intake what that person did. In other words, is that if the relationship becomes so strong that someone really wants to share all of the blessings that they receive with that other person in that moment by virtue of that connection as this person receives that person receives and as that person receives it's a two-way thing that person receives and so you're being raised in rank in ascending spiritually without doing anything outwardly in every single moment 
What a blessing. And this is why they have always said, as the a'mal al-qulub are so much heavier in the scales than the a'mal of the jawadr. The acts of the heart are so much heavier in the scales than the acts that we do with our limbs. And we're not juxtaposing the two to each other. They're both needed. They're not mutually exclusive. We need both. And we are on both fronts simultaneously. And the outward impacts the inward, and the inward impacts the outward, and so forth. However, this is one example of how someone could be benefiting immensely in every single moment and be raised up in degrees merely by having a strong connection with a, another person. And then this translates in the hereafter by virtue of that love, which is the bond of that connection. Then, if Allah, when Allah Ta'ala says, Wajabat mahabbati, la ilaha illallah, that now as a virtue of loving your brother for Allah's sake in the world, Allah will declare Yawm Qiyamah His love for you. And even though nothing is an obligation upon Allah, Allah uses this terminology to emphasize the blessing of having that relationship here. That Allah will surely show His love and give His love to those who love each other for Allah Taala's sake. So, when you look at it from this perspective, what a blessing. To have a deen like this. What a blessing. And that was surely something that impacted this faqir from a very early on, having converted in the Bay Area, and been shown so much love in the Bay Area by so many different beautiful people. And if you would have asked me that as a young man at the age of 19 becoming Muslim, if I would have had very close friends that were like at that time, that 30 years old, so like 10 years older than me, or in their 40s, or even in their 50s, I would have been like, I don't think I'll ever have like close friends that are that old, you know, normally, or kind of roughly in the range of your age group. And they might be a people that you like a few years older, but not only like and respect, they have a close connection with. And then spanning different cultures, from different ethnicities, different ethnic backgrounds, what a blessing. What a blessing from Allah Ta'ala. And those days are sweet. And some of the people, mashallah, are still here. I still remember going to Sidi Yusuf's house, mashallah, tabarakallah, when he was living in East Oakland with our dear brother Mustafa Davis, meeting our Filipino brother, Ramel Rogini, very early on. And his conversion with Shaykh Khutri. Were you there, Amma, when Ramel converted? Abdurrahman? And that... Uh, that Mustafa was trying to give da'wah to Ramel and that he wasn't really trying to hear it but then he just took him to see Sheikh Khutri and his house I think was off Catherine Street was it? and then Sheikh Khutri started talking and uh, that uh, Ramel interrupted him and he confused the word shahada with jihad and so he says I'm ready to take my jihad and he meant like you mean your shahada and then he took his shahada with Sheikh Khutri and that subhanallah that what a blessing, what a blessing. And these meanings, the more that they become firm in the heart, this is what gives us solace when we lose our brothers. This is what gives us solace. That we know that inshallah this is real. And this is not just about this dunya. That inshallah ta'ala, even when we lose people that were our age, that we knew very well, and they return to Allah ta'ala, this is what gives us solace. Because if this is real, it doesn't end with death. And this is why we all need Iman. This is why we all need Iman. There's no way that you can really withstand the vicissitudes of life and to experience difficulty in this world without Iman. We should pity people who have not been blessed with Iman. And pity them not in a way where we think we're better than they are, in a way where we are completely impoverished <clears throat> before our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and thankful for the blessing that we've been given and hold firmly onto it and want the same for other people in hopes that they also get to experience what people of Iman get to experience in this world. <clears throat> but this is why it's so important that we preserve it and that we talk about it and we put ourselves in environments regularly so that it can increase 
because we know that Iman increases and decreases based upon what it is that we do. So his book is on the adab of suhba wal ukhuwa, the various etiquettes of companionship and brotherhood. But he doesn't stop there. Wal mu'ashara. Mu'ashara is to spend time with someone, to interact with someone. Ma'al asnaf al khalq. And so in interacting with all different types of people. And this is one of the chapters, of course, that he didn't translate. But there is a beautiful section at the end where he talks about the hukuk of a Muslim, the rights of a Muslim, and then the, right, the rights of your, the neighbor, and then the rights of others. And this is very important. Actually, that might have been a better place for us to begin. Let's all start from the level of giving each other their rights. But really in our context, there's so many of us that are not giving other Muslims their rights. We, it's hard for us to even talk about brotherhood. <laughs> because brotherhood's after that. And if you look at all, maybe if we have time, I'll just read through a few of them. And most of them you probably already know. But when you see them listed, it's very impactful. <laughs> because you realize that, wow, I, maybe that's where we should begin. Is let's give everybody their rights first because... The rights are not voluntary. This is not where we're like, oh, I'm going to think about whether I should give this brother his right or not, or this sister her right or not. You have to give everybody the rights. And we did a series uh, not too long ago that in uh, the weekly gathering that we had of recitation of the Moded, where we were looking at the rights of Muslims, and we didn't finish, and it would have probably required like another eight or nine sessions, because the, it's actually quite extensive. And that these rights are important because it's the glue that keeps people together, that keeps a community together, that keeps a masjid together, and so forth and so on. It keeps even a family together. And so they can't be that understated. Anyhow, this is essentially what this book is all about. And that he always begins he, each, each book of the Ahya with uh, Dibaja, this beautiful that flowery, that rhyme prose. And he says here, Alhamdulillah ladhi ghamara safwati ibadihi bi lata'if al-takhsisi qawlan wa imtinanan. So we'll just translate this very generally. He says, all praise be to the one who has that immersed the choice servant of his with the subtle manifestations of singling him out that solely from his bounty. Wa allafa bayna qulubihim and that he that created familiarity and love between their hearts and so they became through his blessing ikhwanin brothers he removed all rancor and rancor is just a terrible thing in the heart that prevents you from having a good connection with a person from their hearts, فَظَلُّوا فِي الدُّنْيَ أَصْدِقَاءُ وَأَخْدَانَا And that so that they remained while they were here in this world, friends and loved ones. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَرَفَقَاءَ وَخِلَّانًا And then in the hereafter, they will be companions and that intimate friends. وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدِ الْمُصْطَفَى And may the peace and blessings be upon that our Master Muhammad, the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon his family and companions, those that followed them, وَقْتَدُوبِهِ and that followed in his example, قَوْلًا وَفِعْلًا وَعَدْلًا وَإِحْسَانًا and they followed what he did, what he said, and were just as he was just, and that showed excellence as he showed excellence, صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمْ and one of the great blessings, we should never be wary of these introductions and sometimes people when they give introduction people say okay let's just get to the point why do you think all the scholars did this they're not just doing it for the sake of doing it they're not just doing it because oh that sounds good let's just begin with some flowery rhymed prose that's not why they're doing it they're doing it for a very 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 deep meaning everything that is that we're going to talk about what they're saying is this has come to us through transmission. There's a source. This is ultimately 
that rooted in revelation by Allah given to the Prophet in terms of the Quran vis-a-vis -vis the Archangel Gabriel and then that through the various other prophetic narrations and those generations that the Prophet, the generation that the Prophet reared himself that generation that were his companions including those that were directly from his family وسلم, and then the, those that follow them and that learn from them and learn from them until this day and age what a blessing there's so many meanings in this so that this doesn't just remain an academic exercise where this is not about mental acrobatics where we can analyze the text of the Ahya and show exactly that's interesting to do and sometimes you can point to the fact that that's important in many ways but that's not the whole point is to let just in a very academic fashion look at these words and talk about how great they are what really matters is that we put them into practice and by always starting with that proper introduction one of the many meanings there is that everything that it is that we are talking about is not just theory there are individuals that in although they were human beings had put these meanings into practice in the very highest way that are then exemplars for the generations that come after them that can inspire you and I who are trying to learn maybe we won't call it here theory but the knowledge portion of this and how it is that you and I can put it into practice we know this has been done by generations of people that came before us we know that throughout the centuries people after those early generations also learn these principles and put them into practice and by beginning in this way we're connecting ourselves to that tradition and positioning ourselves to not just have these words enter into one ear and exit the next but in a very real way that we then can put them into practice so he says here amma ba'd kalimat al-intiqal he's transferring now from his introductory words to what it is that this book is all about fanittahabba fi llahi ta'ala loving each other for Allah tabarak wa ta'ala's sake mutual love tahabbub wal ukhuwa fi dinihi and that brotherhood for the, his sake, brotherhood in his religion, min afdal al qurbat are from the greatest ways that we draw near to Allah. Wa altaf ma yustafad min al taat fi majal al adat. This is a very precise ibar. And the most subtle of things that are benefited from things that are considered to be taat, acts of worship that relate to our adat, the customary things that we do as a part of our human life. There are conditions though that serve as prerequisites when they are fulfilled, those that are with each other outwardly, they have companionship, will then be considered to be among the ranks of those who love each other for Allah to barakatah's sake. Just as وَفِيَهَا hukukun, hukukun, They have rights بِمُرَاعَاتِهَا تَصْفُ الْأُخُوَى When those rights are fulfilled, the brotherhood is pure. It's pure. تَصْفُ الْأُخُوَى عَنْ شَوَائِبُ الْكُدُرَاتِ وَنَزَغَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ From all of the different blemishes that might arise or the various whisperings and promptings of the shaitan. What a beautiful frame. So sometimes we think of rights in a very different sense. But he's pointing to one of the wisdom, one of the wisdoms of hukuk, of rights, is that when they're preserved, you're going to be able to preserve the brotherhood. In particular, he says, tasful uhuwa. So all of us have had friends in our lives. And we know that sometimes certain things happen we have challenges where we don't feel the same way about those people as we did before. And it might have been because of a shortcoming on one of the two sides in one way or another. Or someone didn't feel that this, their brother helped them in this particular instance or keeps in touch with them or does something of some sort. And what a beautiful frame that when we look at the whole idea of hukuk, it's not just about, okay, there's something I have to do. No, 
This is a blessing from Allah to preserve what it is that we're supposed to receive from that particular thing, in this case, brotherhood. So when people fulfill the rights, there'll be safa, there'll be purity in the relationship. And that purity is a prerequisite, or you could say, is a channel that leads to love. If there's kudurat, which is like kadar, which is the opposite of purity, where that your heart is just not feeling the same about your brother, you're bothered by something that he did, something that he said, or something he didn't do or didn't say. That prevents, right? That prevents love from being there in the heart because you're caught up on that particular thing. And on one hand, is that your brother needs to do a little better. On your hand too, there's things that you need to do to clear that channel and so that the love is mutual and is flowing back and forth. So by upholding their rights, someone draws closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by preserving it, is that the highest of degrees are attained. So he's going to now clarify the aims of this book which fall into three chapter headings. And the Al-Bab al-Awwal, the first chapter, is on the fadila, the merit of that what is called ulfa or ilfa. And this is a, a, a word that means <coughs> like familiarity. <coughs> it could also be translated as the, the love that's in your heart for another person. Um, that even it could also be translated as intimacy um, and um, that and then uhuwa is brotherhood so he's going to talk about the merit of it its conditions its degrees and its benefits and then in chapter 2 he talks about the rights of companionship and the adab the etiquettes and the lawazimiha the necessary things that must be present when you are taking the companionship of someone. And then it's in the third chapter that he'll get into the various rights. We'll talk about the right of a Muslim, the right of family members, the rights of your neighbors, the rights of that all these different types of people that we are interacting with. And so before that we look at this first part, which is on the fadila, the merit, uh, let's just walk through here very quickly. Um, some of these other chapters because he includes in the introduction the, the, the general topics that he'll cover but he has some very interesting topics here and um, he has one that says Bayanu ma'na he has a whole breakdown it's going to be hard for us to get to this because it's a very precise and detailed discussion but Imam Ghazali is a master of wanting us to understand the frame and get it right from the beginning and then he'll talk about the details and this is a beautiful example of how he unites transmitted knowledge with the rational knowledge and the way that he explains things doesn't allow anyone to misunderstand any of the details outside of context because he almost always throughout the entire Ihya provides the context so book one, in a sense, provides the whole context of the entire Ihya al -Muddin. But then in the second half of the Ihya, he provides the context for the remaining part of his book. And then in each book, he provides the context for the specific subject. And then sometimes in some of his tangents, he'll provide the context for the particular discussion, which is within that particular chapter. He wants us to understand, in the broadest sense, how to situate this particular topic in terms of our understanding of the deen. And this is very beautiful and extremely helpful. And the more you read Imam Ghazali's books, the more by reading it, it trains you to be able to do this. So, you might be speaking to a person, and that person could be a Muslim, or a person could be a not-Muslim, and there's something that you want to talk to them about. And if you don't know how to speak about that topic in context, then you are likely to miss the mark. 
And you'll speak to them, but you won't reach them. And here is that the outward dimension is not enough. The inward dimension is also very important. And really the inner dimension is more important. Because sometimes if your heart is enlightened, even if you make a mistake in terms of that, your words can pierce people's hearts. And um, I've seen people that outwardly, you would probably say like, that, oh, that's kind of bad da'wah. But it worked really well. Like bad in terms of like the way that you think that you actually should have dealt with that particular situation. But it worked very well. Right? I've seen people that are very blessed, like when my father was in Tarim, give him very direct da'wah. And actually it was in the context of brotherhood. Um, uh, there was this instance where, and this was a, one of the great scholars of Tarim. Uh, and he was talking to my father and you know, saying a number of things, and I was translating, of course. And um, then, you know, he was saying how that he, you know, brotherhood is a good thing. We want to have that more people that are considered to be from our brothers. But then he got very jalali. Allah says, but if you leave without becoming Muslim, mash your right? There's no brotherhood, right? I was like, whoa, how do I translate that? So, um, anyhow, that. If someone else would say that to someone, like you could lose them forever. But this person was such a special person, and a man of Allah, is that it actually had the opposite effect upon my father. Even though it didn't, he didn't become Muslim right then and there, that he left the gathering kind of in awe and was doing nothing but praising that particular individual because of that person's presence. So sometimes people have the ability to do that. Nevertheless, what we like ultimately is to balance between the two where we take into consideration the context, but then we that know then how to speak about and articulate the particular point that we're trying to make. Imam Ghazali is a master at this. And so he has this whole discussion about what does it mean, like in its reality, in its, what is the true nature of ukhuwa fillah, that having brotherhood for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. And we're not going to say brotherhood and sisterhood. It's understood when we say brotherhood. This includes the sisterhood of the sisters with the other sisters, and that's a given. Um, so, and then he wants to give us clear signs on how to distinguish that from that a more worldly type of brotherhood. And so he goes into these that breakdowns of that loving someone for their essence. And then loving someone for other than their essence, but for a worldly reason. And then loving someone that not for their essence, for another person, for another reason. But then the benefits of that relationship doesn't come back to any worldly benefit, rather. It's for the afterlife. As I mentioned, it gets very technical. And then that finally, that loving someone for the sake of Allah. And what does that actually mean? and so forth and so on. So he goes into a lot of detail there of all of the reasons that we love and gets to the heart of the matter. What does it truly mean to love for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala? Um, even if we don't study this, by looking at what we need to look at, we'll still get the gist of this chapter. But if we did want to read further and we have access to Arabic, it is worth reading. Because he then follows that chapter up with another chapter, Bayan al Bughdi Fillah. And um, that this is the, the exposition on Bughd, which is the opposite of Hug. That you have love for the sake of Allah and that you have hate for the sake of Allah. And we have to again frame this properly because uh, this is a topic in our time that when you start speaking about Bughd Fillah, people get very sensitive, like, oh, wait, what do you mean? Right? And people will jump on you very quickly about this type, this concept, but it's very simple. There's things that we love and there's things that we hate. And you just think about in terms of your own body. Allah made you naturally inclined to like certain things and to dislike certain things to protect your physical body. Does, does any of us like pain? Nobody likes pain unless there's something that wrong with them. No one likes to be in, have pain. So we've all burnt our finger before on the stove. And we know that hurts. So we hate, and this is the thing is when you speak about it in English, it's just even difficult to, 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 to 
because we don't speak, speak of it necessarily in the same sense. But we hate to be burned. Okay? So our hatred of being burned protects us from being burned. You're careful around the stove. You're careful around fire. When you hate something or you dislike something, it's a means for you to be protected from that thing. Okay? And even in terms of fire, the same distinction is there. We don't hate fire for the sake of hating fire. We hate the fact that that fire will hurt us if it touches our hand. But at the same time, fire is a sign of Allah. And that it's that a part of the wonder of His creation. So from the standpoint of fire being fire, we see it as something Allah Ta'ala created and try to learn the wisdom of it. But from the standpoint that it burns us, it's something that we don't like. The same thing goes with people. Is that people that are going to harm us in this world and in the next, i.e. if we let what is in them seep into us. So some type of disbelief or some type of bad trait of some sort. By you hating that person, and we'll clarify what that means, it's a protection for you from having that thing that will harm you that reach you. So just as we don't want to be harmed by in any physical sense, we definitely, and it's even a greater type of harm, don't want to be harmed in a spiritual or religious sense. And so that hating now is not hating the person's essence. We hate the trait that they have within them that would then harm us. So insofar as there's disbelief in that person, we have to hate disbelief to protect ourselves from it. We have to hate bad character. We have to hate wrong in order to protect ourselves from it. But we don't hate the person itself who is, has that disbelief or that wrong unless they die in that state. And that's how they were sealed until that Yom Qiyamah. But then, how do we really know how people ended? We judge outwardly according to the Shia. So in general, in most case scenarios, when it comes to other people, what we mean by hating for the sake of Allah is to protect ourselves from anything that would derail us in relation to this religion. And that's totally understood. That's natural. We do without everything else. Why wouldn't that be the same case when it comes to uh, the religion and it comes to the ardeen? So that's a topic in and of itself, but he goes into great detail about this. And then he has this very uh, beneficial section. And he says, the, the various descending degrees of various people that we have to have bughad for for the sake of Allah, that we have to dislike for the sake of Allah. And how did you interact with them? And this is really, really important because he goes into all of these details where, first of all, he talks about uh, people, kufr, disbelief. Not everybody is the same. And he'll talk about, in a very traditional sense, Right? The muharib, the one who's at war with the Muslims, is not like the themmi. And then that the themmi that might be a family member is not like the themmi who's not a family member. And then in our context, living as a Muslim minority in that a non-Muslim majority country has it. So there's a lot of nuance here of various degrees of even disbelief. And then someone who is that agnostic might be a little bit different than someone who is that outwardly atheist. And then atheist in our context now, there's multiple ways. John Gray has a book on, I think it's called The Seven Types of Atheism. Yani, there's so much detail here. But this is very important knowledge that you and I have to have. When we are interacting with people, especially in a place like we are, we're not in the Muslim world. And there are different ways in this particular regard that we might deal with certain things that would be dealt differently in a Muslim country. And um, there's a lot of examples of that. But then also in relation to the other aspects, he goes into details where he talks about the mubtara, the person who has a heretical belief. But is he calling to that or is he not calling to that? Would he impact someone? Would he not impact someone? And so forth and so on. 
that we deal with all of these different people in different ways, and then the Asi, someone who is um, that not practicing the way that they should in, in a state of disobedience. Are they that outwardly doing it? Or are they hiding it? Are they impacting other people and calling to it? Or are they not? All of these people are different, and we deal with them differently. And we have to know the time and place for everything. And in general, what I understand, if you want to summarize our time, this is a time that is very difficult, and this is a time where we have to focus on mercy and to be a source of upliftment for people. This is really a time where we have to have overwhelming mercy for people and really try to embrace people and to inspire people and to uplift people. This is a very, very difficult time. And this is why it's so important not to read these texts out of context, to read these texts from masters who have put them into practice and show you how specifically to put them into practice in your given time and in your given circumstance. And ultimately, this is one of the meanings of fiqh, in the deen, in the broadest sense of having an understanding of the deen. And you understand there are different ways that we ultimately deal with every person. But in a day where you have things like industrial medicine where it's just one medicine for all, and it's not necessarily tailored to the individual, and we have this lost wisdom of things like temperaments, where we recognize, okay, that maybe every human being doesn't need eight glasses of water a day. Maybe this one only needs four. Maybe this one needs five. And that even these, that people that are into natural, that medicine and cures, and all of a sudden there's a type of food that comes out. And then everybody's on board to, everybody's, right, drinking pomegranate juice or doing this, where we lose the nuance. And we forget that, no, actually, we have to have individual device for every individual person. And sometimes it's somewhat similar, and sometimes there's certain things that work for groups of people. But this is where wisdom is, is that lies, is that how to interact with each individual person. And what do we need to know to give them the correct advice or to speak to them in the right way at the right time. And I remember, and this is a, this is a, this was this was such a lesson. I remember being present where there was someone who came to my teacher, and he asked him, or he said to him, that I haven't prayed in years. I haven't prayed in years. And this person clearly was broken, and wasn't happy at the fact that he hadn't prayed. And my teacher responded by saying, the most important thing of all is to maintain humility in your heart. That was his response. And was he saying that it was okay for him not to pray? No, of course not. But he felt that he knew with his Basira in that particular instance, this person was so broken if he would have come down hard on him and be like, what's wrong with you? Why haven't you prayed? That little, 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 right? That don't you realize that every prayer that you miss, that your name is posted on how far that this person named Mr. Prayer, he has to enter. That would have probably destroyed that person. And that led him to completely give up and to completely lose hope. So he indicated that based upon his particular state, what he needed to do in order to start praying again. And because this person is also looking for a sense of belonging, and this is something that's very important for anyone that's running a masjid or is that, that in related and in, in is involved with the community, the vast majority of people are looking for a sense of belonging. We all are. We all are. And this person that needed that reinforcement that, okay, I still have, even though I've done these major sins, which he knew that they were wrong, but the sense of belonging is still there. And as a result, that this individual started praying again, 
shortly after that. But this is wisdom. This is wisdom. And this is how it is that you and I need to be with various types of people. So this gives us an understanding of the different types of people. And it's reminiscent of that uh, what Ibn Mawak says in his book, Sanan al Muhtadin, where he talks about the seven the stations of the religion. So um, then he's going to talk about the various traits that we should look in for the people that we want to take the companionship of. And that, inshallah ta'ala, we will get to. And then he gets into the rights, uh, sorry, he gets into the, uh, uh, the conditions of, of, of brotherhood. And then he'll get into the various rights. So that's roughly what he's doing uh, in this book. And so inshallah ta'ala, we will try to cover as much as we can. But uh, we're going to, uh, for the remaining part of this session, look at some of the blessed narrations that indicate the merit of Ulfa in Ukhuwa in their conditions. So the way that he prefaces this is that he talks about the importance of Ulfa, and this is directly mentioned in a hadith, which we will get to. But he says here is that Ulfa, which is something that the Sharia and our Prophet encouraged, to have familiarity between ourselves, to love each other for Allah Taala's sake, to have that uh, sense of, of intimacy in relationships. And this doesn't mean between man and woman, this, this means between that the same gender. He says that Ulfa is the thamara, it is the fruit of good character. When you have good character, people naturally will that have a good relationship. When people that are alienated from each other, it is the fruit of having bad character. So good character leads to mutual love, that mutual familiarity, and tawafuq, where people are getting along. Whereas bad character, yuthmirat tabaghut, leads people to be at odds with one another, what tahasud, where they envy one another, what tadabr, where they are that now alienated from each other. وَمَهْمَا كَانَ الْمُثْمَرَ مَحْمُودًا كَانَتَ الثَّمَرَ مَحْمُودًا and so that when the fruit is praiseworthy, is that that which the fruit leads to is also praiseworthy. So he frames this whole discussion in terms of good character, which is beautiful. He doesn't just get right into the narrations. He says that if we are going to really have good relationships and establish a brotherhood for Allah Ta'ala's sake, and have people that we experience the realities of this, the very first thing we have to discuss is good character. Because if you don't have good character, that relationship is going to be short-lived. And then to the degree of the good character is to the degree that relationship will remain and be permanent in this world then and the next. In other words, it is good character ultimately that will that enable us to have that true brothers and sisters for the sake of Allah wa ta'ala. So then let's just pause here. What is good character? And how does it relate to this? Good character essentially is, if we define it according to Imam Ghazali, having the ability to not be affected by thoughts that come from shaitan or our nafs. In other words, we don't respond to the thoughts that come from either shaitan or our nafs. That's the essence of what good character is. In other words, when good character is not expecting people to deal with us the way that we want them to that deal with us. It is when people deal with us in a way that we don't care for or we don't like, we don't respond in the way that we shouldn't. To go a little bit deeper, it all gets back to what we let ourselves do at the inside of our hearts. And let's say there's just something annoying that one of our friends does. He just has a bad habit. Right? He's just annoying. There's something that it's our brother, but he's uh, there's something that he does to annoy us. Do we let ourselves be annoyed by that thing? 
Or do we have magnanimity of soul? Where even though that's annoying us, we don't even let ourselves think about it. Let alone backbite that person to someone else in relation to that thing. Let alone joke with that person about that particular thing. We just overlook it. And even though it's annoying us, we don't let our nafs, which dislikes that, lash out for that thing. Or we don't let shaitan use that as he tends to do, is that, and this is the where it gets really complicated, where just a simple annoyance and all of a sudden something else happens, and then shaitan will turn that annoyance into something that it's actually even not. And then make you in your heart like, see, that's why you shouldn't spend time with that person. Right? Don't go to that gathering if that person is going to be there. And then if you're not aware of that this is happening, you end up falling victim to that thought and do something that prevents the brotherhood. So if we can't learn what good character is, which requires us to know what is transpiring at the level of the heart and the various heart's thoughts that arise within the heart and so forth in a very detailed way, we're never going to really have that good relationship with people. And then kind of in the context of what we just mentioned, we also have to have realistic expectations. So we were talking about the maqamat of the deen, the seven stations of the deen, and the various degrees in the context of that having dislike for Allah Ta'ala's sake. But even brotherhood itself, and this is just for me, this is not from Imam Lazadi, let's just say that there's seven or ten different degrees of brotherhood. Let's just say ten. And we have to recognize where we're at with any given person. And the general breakdown would be if you just kind of read about this in like a book on psychology or something, they usually classify friends into extremely like close friends, friends and acquaintances. And they've done studies on how many close friends the vast majority of people tend to have, how many friends they have and how many acquaintances that they have and then just in general how many people they know. And there's studies that can point to this. But there's no doubt your close friends usually are only going to be a few people. But what a blessing to even have one close friend in our time. And that close friend, when we look at what a ten would be, when we talk about the Hukuki Imam Ghazali mentions, there might be a few people in the world that have that, but it's rare. At that level, at the highest level. But the whole point of what I'm trying to get at here is, let's say your reality with someone is that you're at a level four. You can't delude yourself to think that you're at a level seven. Because as you move up in the levels, there's more that's required. And this is one of the meanings, differently, differently applied, of course, of nuhina and tekelluf. Tekelluf is to try to do something that you can't really do. And al bin mawjud, when you have people to your home, you serve them what you have. And, you know, buying groceries and stuff to prepare for guests, that doesn't negate that. But going outside of your means does. Just do what you can. Same thing with relationships. We've got to keep it real. We can't try to act we're at level 7 if we're really at 4. And if we do, you'll put strain on the relationship and that 4 might be bumped down to a 1 or a 2. And I've experienced this in my life. You all probably experienced this as well. And then when you start to learn like, oh, I should have had more wisdom in that situation and just back off a little bit and be thankful that I'm at a four with that particular brother and everything's fine. And then you remain and you keep that level with that particular brother. And over time, it might move up to a five. But the whole point here is, we don't have to be best friends with everybody. You have to give everybody, on the other hand, their rights. So that's the baseline. You give everybody their rights. And then, you move up in degrees after that. And you keep it real, and you don't try to act like you're a place that you're not. And this is very important, especially if we are trying to uh, develop a way of approaching this deen that spans uh, certain geographical locations, and let's just speak in the context of the United States of America, is that ultimately we are one ummah. 
And whereas academics, you know, criticize this whole concept of ummah and talk about how there was no historical reality to it, that's nonsense. We are an ummah, and there's a reality to it to various degrees. But the whole point is we're supposed to live up to that. So the concept of the ummah is not one that's passive. Rather, it's active, i.e., this is something we have to live up to. And actually, that experience what it means to be a part of the ummah. And this is one of the meanings of our Prophet being a Nabi al-Ummi. Yes, the unlettered Prophet, but the Nabi of his ummah. This is a valid meaning of a Nabi al-Ummi. That's mansub to his ummah. His ummah in reality is mansub to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but because of his care for his ummah. And so, all of those that moments where the Prophet ﷺ has huzn, right? Huzn, grief in his heart. And subhanAllah, when the veil's lifted, when the veil's lifted and someone sees what people are doing and the consequences for what it is that they've done, and then to still have to keep it all together and with mercy and gentleness take them to the path and help them get out of what they're in, that's one of the most difficult things of all. And it's only that in talking to people like that that you realize la ilaha illallah, the toll that that takes on them. And there's people like that to this day. That Allah has lifted the veil, that there are people of Basira. They know the consequences of certain things that people do. And it's not something because they've seen it through a lifting of the veil. It is hard for them. It's hard for them to even function normally as a human being. And it's here that you just start to understand the tip of the iceberg. La'allaka baqiyu nafsaka. That perhaps that you are about to kill yourself out of grief. And just imagine everything that we do is shown to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything. Imagine some of the things that you and I know that we've done being shown to the best of creation. And the pain that he feels as a result. I mean, if that were the only thing to prevent us from doing wrong, it should suffice. Ya Rab, I just don't want to bring hardship to the Rasul. I don't want to bring pain to his heart. That would suffice. Okay, I'm, I'm caught. I can't. If that's the only, I'm just not going to do it for that reason. That motivates us to get ourselves together. And then on the opposite as well, imagine bringing happiness to the heart of the Rasul. And we hope by coming together to study these meanings, these meanings of his deen, that in a time where people are doing whatever, that this is that a small time that we spend together where we're doing things that will bring happiness to his heart. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So this is the crux of the matter. Is it ultimately gets back to that having good character. And I'm going to quote one hadith because Asabah is giving me the time out signal. Is that... Our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's different narrations. This is in the narration of Imam Ahmad. Is that Al Mu'minu that Alifun Ma'luf. La khaira fi man la ya'laf wa la yu'laf. And so the believer befriends and allows himself to be befriended. There is no good in someone who does not befriend or allow himself to be befriended. And so. Our Prophet is giving us a golden principle here on how it is that we can carry ourselves. And we should, in general, carry ourselves in a way where we're bringing people together, where we're bringing hearts together. We, we are sources and means for people to love one another. We are that means for people to that live right. We are means for people to be uplifted. It's how we carry ourselves. And of course, people are different in this regard. And temperament does play a big role. And we cannot underestimate the importance of temperaments. And for some temperaments, this is harder than others. This hadith for melancholics is a challenge. It's a challenge. For people that tend to be more in modern psychology terms, introverts, 
and that this type of this is harder for people like this that don't do as well at the public gathering or mixing with other people or that don't tend to but you still have to that have a portion of this even if you're like that you can't say it's just my temperament خلاص. no our prophet said لا خير. right have your nasib your portion of it so at least you are doing the bare minimum in regards to it but what a beautiful hadith it is setting up the, the, the basis for all of the good that comes and why did our prophet system speak so emphatically when he's talking about this matter and there's multiple narrations because of all of the good that comes from society when people have good relationships and all of the harms that come from society when people are at odds with one another this is one of the most important things of all and you could say without exaggeration the secret of the hijrah was the Os and the Khazraj coming together and then the secret of the Medinan phase was the union of the Muhajirin and the Ansar and then the rest is history that you have a spread of this deen within a hundred years that was faster than the spread of anything else that previously and anything else after it from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so relationships are key let's stop there being like ta'ala we'll pick up where we left off and that get through as much as this as we can may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and open up our hearts to understand these meanings and to put it into practice and may Allah ta'ala bless us to live these meanings and to be that means for people to come together and to love each other for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu ala seyyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Okay Bismillahi Rahman Rahim Alhamdulillah Wa salatu wa salam Ala Rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Wa man wa ala Okay so let's see What we're going to do next year There was a few other narrations that I, I, I did want to uh, I did want to cover, but I, th I think I'll just uh, suffice ourselves with uh, one more. And um, this is with the intention of there's a, a very practical benefit to this particular hadith, and um, it's one of the ways in it's a very easy way of. That doing things with no other ulterior motive other than to that do that particular thing as a way of strengthening brotherhood. So we'll read the narration first. It's in Sahih Muslim. That our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there was a man who visited his brother for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that Allah wa ta'ala knew this and sent an angel to go observe this particular individual. And so he came in human form and asked this person, Aina Turid, where are you going? And he says that Urid and Uzura Ahi Fulan, that I am going, I want to visit my brother so and so. He mentioned his name. And then the angel said to him, Li hajatan laka Do you have some type of need that he is going to fulfill? And he said, No. He said, Is there any qaraba? Are you related somehow? And he said, no. He said, Is that, did he do something good for you? And you're kind of going to like repay him or something? And he said, no. He said, So the angel asked this individual, Why are you going to visit him then? And he said, I love him for the sake of Allah. And then look what the angel says. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَىٰ أَرْسَلَنِ إِلَيْكِ Allah Ta'ala sent me to you يُخْبِرُكَ بِأَنَّهُ يُحِبُّكَ And Allah sent me to you to inform you that He subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you بِحُبَّكْ إِيَّا Because of your love for your brother وَقَدْ أَوْجَبَ لَكَ الْجَنَّةِ And that love that you have for him has necessitated your entry into paradise what a blessing. Like seriously, like you read these ahadith and it just really 
fills your heart with joy that you're a Muslim and that we have this blessed deen. And this is uh, one of the great manifestations of our Prophet ﷺ being the Bab Miftah Rahmatillah, the door to the key to the door of Allah Ta'ala's mercy. Look at all of these doors of mercy that open up. So how can we bring this hadith into our life? It really is one of the most important things that we can do, is to visit brothers for Allah Tabaraka's sake. I know you live in the Bay Area. I know sometimes your brother or friend is an hour and a half drive and you don't want to get on the uh, 680 or 880 or whatever direction you're going. Now there's traffic at all different times of day, both directions. But try to have this be something you do from time to time. Visit someone for no other reason. There's, no, there's nothing that you want from them. There's nothing that you need to do. There's nothing that you need them to do. Simply, you're visiting for Allah Ta'ala's sake. And it doesn't mean that you have to spend two or three hours with them. It could be a short visit. But we need to reestablish this culture. And we can't let our busy lives and our work lives or even our family lives prevent us from doing this. And we need to have in-person visits from time to time. Even if it's only once a month, you say, okay, I'm just going to visit someone once a month. And think about the people that you love and just go visit them. And the beautiful thing is in Muslim cultures, in traditional Muslim cultures, there were certain times where this was customary. So, for instance, where the time that I spent in, in, in Hadramot and Tirim, the after Asr period was a time that people tended to be at home, and especially kind of like an hour after the Salat was prayed. And this would be a time where you could just knock on someone's door, and their door actually might even be left open. It was a time where they have kind of put that in as part of their cultural practice that they were ready to receive guests at this time. And it's not a meal time, but you might come and have tea, and tea is kind of already being prepared anyway. And this is something that is beautiful. I know we don't operate like that, and that because of our northern latitudes, that the times fluctuate in relation to prayer, so it makes it a little bit difficult to have a specific time year-round that you do that. But you can at least from time to time, once a month, try to do this. And if you can't do it in person, then call someone. And for no other reason, just to call them, to talk to them, ask them how they're doing, that talk about something that benefits, or text them, or that send them a picture that if you think that that picture would bring happiness to their heart or something like this. And with no other intention, no other ulterior motive, other than that you're doing this for the sake of Allah Taala, ta And hopefully that we'll receive portions of this great reward by doing these little things. And this is something that creates mawadda and creates love between the hearts. So I think at this point we're going to shift gears uh, slightly. And we're going to look at some of the traits Imam Ghazali says should be there in the people that we bring especially close to us. And again, this is not meant to be exclusive for the sake of being exclusive. We're here to help everyone and uplift everyone. but. As people get closer to you, there are certain traits that you want to look for. Why? Because the people that are really close to you, they are a testimony to your deen. So that a man is on the religion of his close companion. Meaning that it is highly likely you wouldn't have been that close unless you're very similar in relation to the, your religion. And so Imam Ghazali gives us a number of traits that we should look for. And he mentions khams khisal. Is that first of all that the person in yukuna aqilan. And we'll go through these after we list them. They have intelligence. They have their hasan al khuluq. They have good character. And then ghayra fasiqan. And what this means is they're not someone who is outwardly falling short and falling into acts of disobedience. They're not someone that has misunderstandings of the religion and beliefs that you shouldn't really have or opinions about things that are odd or strange. Nor should they be someone who 
they're covetous towards the world. That's all they want is dunya. And again, it doesn't mean that we create a dichotomy between our deen and our dunya. But we all know that there are certain people that all they're about is making money. We know that. Right? There are certain people that's all they think about, that's all they want, that's all they're concerned about. They're willing to that uh, that take shortcuts into that cross what should be red lines in order to do that. So this is what we have to be careful of. So the first is aql, is intelligence. And what this really means is not that they got a good score on the SATs. That's not what Imam al is referring here to. What he means is in the true sense of the word, is that people that have intelligence and really a type of religious intelligence, where they understand their religion and they tend to be wise people who know how to put it into practice. And um, it could at times refer to certain people that even kind of in a, a very general sense lack intelligence. But really what he means by this is that someone who understands things as they are, they have an awareness. And people that don't tend to have this, when they get close to you, and especially if there's trust, might unconsciously lead you astray without you even knowing as a result of this. So this is something that we want to look for in someone. Is it someone who has a good understanding? Someone that has a good approach to life? You could even extend it to that type of understanding. That has wisdom, that they have experience. And this will set the foundation for the remaining traits. And then the second one is someone that has good character. Because again, and what we mean by this is at a basic level of good character. We don't mean by this is that someone has to be that flawless. We all know that uh, people uh, do make mistakes and they have various degrees of their ability to maintain good character in various situations. But it, they have a general that sense about themselves that they are good people. And taking it back to what we mentioned in the previous session, if we are saying that good character is the foundation of preserving a relationship, in all of those meanings, not allowing ourselves to fall victim to the thoughts of, that come from the ego or the thoughts that come from shaitan. If someone doesn't have good character, and one of the worst manifestations of that is bukhul, is miserliness. Miserliness is a bad character trait. And when we detail it, in that put it under the microscope, what we find is it relates to that thought in the moment, in the worry that accompanies it, that if I give this out, I'm not going to benefit from it. And it's not, I'm going to lose it. And so that thought comes to the heart and you, you hold on to it. So there's a time where you could actually really benefit your brother financially. But then you hold on to it because of that miserliness that's in your soul, even though that you could. So miserliness, uh, that giving is not ethar. Ethar is a higher stage where the highest stage of ethar, preferring others over yourself, is that even if you're in absolute need, it's still a virtue to prefer other, others over yourself, even if you die. Now, not everybody can do that. That's the degree of the Sahaba. <laughs> but in our context, like it's a great station to read a stage of ethar where you're preferring others over yourself so you don't remain in a state of luxury. So if someone intentionally downsized so that they could that support a cause or so that their monthly expenses wouldn't be as much and they would have more money to give out. That's a great blessing. And that's, that's something that, you know, when we were talking in the khutbah about like our, when was that? That was another thing. Anyhow, that this whole idea that like studying sacred knowledge was a thing of the 90s. Oh yeah, that's so 90s, bro. Right, going to study sacred knowledge. Right, miskeen, right? It's almost like the same sense of like dunya, when people like downsize like, are you okay? Right, they go and 
like do aza almost. Like, is everything okay? You're, you're supposed to, you know, get a better house in a nicer neighborhood and that, yes, at the age of 60, take on a new mortgage that you had already paid off the old one just so that you can move into the new area. Yeah, these are decisions that we all need to make. And as we get older, we should have more zuhud. Doesn't mean you have to give everything up, but small little things that you do. And freeing yourself up because you're not having zuhud for the sake of having zuhud. You're detaching to free yourself up to focus more on what's going to remain in the hereafter. And that's an important point. So really, that you're having zuhud in something that will be of less benefit for that, which will be of more benefit. So good character, but that's an example, is like stinginess. Or jubin, which is cowardice. There are certain times where it requires that you defend the honor of your friend, but you're worried to say anything. And so, that because of that worry, and then the thoughts that, oh, if I say something, what's going to happen to me? And that circle of friends or whatever else, that you don't do the right thing. That's a manifestation of bad character. And how can you really have a friend that's not going to defend you when you need to be defended? Right? Another classic example is ghadab, anger. If we can't control our anger, that an outlash of anger is a manifestation of bad character. Uncontrollable anger causes innumerable problems in all different types of relationships. So learning to control our anger, and it would be very hard to maintain a relationship with someone in the long term if they are constantly having fits of uncontrollable anger. It's a problem. And unfortunately that we live in a society that is creating more and more uncontrollable anger. Now, it doesn't mean that we necessarily that avoid these people entirely, but what he's talking about here is that the people that you want really close to you. If they are a very fiery person that are constantly getting angry, that's hard, right? that's hard. Um, and then there's other examples to mention there. So intelligence, but really kind of like a religious intelligence combined with good character. And then that avoiding that acts of depravity. And the technical definition of what is called a facet in the uh, traditional way of understanding that is that this is someone who that openly commits an abominable act, i.e. a major sin, or that repeatedly does a lesser sin. And this is generally speaking the definition that they give, but we could simply put it in the context of people that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. If people are close to us and we know that they are openly doing things that are harmful to their religion, it's very hard to maintain a relationship and not fall into the same problem. We end up, oftentimes, the doors open up for us to do what it is that they're doing. So this is something that we want to think very carefully about. And then the fourth thing that he mentions here is not having a misunderstanding in the deen. And this is very important because if we know if people have beliefs that are problematic, in relation to what it is that we believe, or that they have strange opinions on certain matters for whatever reason. Uh, people tend to get affected by this. And you'd be surprised how suhba and companionship affects the way that people think. And especially people that have clean slates. They pick up very quickly on the way that other people talk about certain ideas and tend to parrot them that back right away. And that people that are a little bit more grounded in knowledge, okay, that might not happen as quickly. But you'd be surprised. Sometimes, and you really have to keep your guard up, even if you're aware certain things seep in from the people that you're around. And we want to make sure that we are believing proper just as we are practicing proper. So we don't want people really close to us that have beliefs that are problematic. And then the final that point here is 
that um, uh, that someone that is not haris ada dunya, and that all of us, to a certain degree, of course, love this world. This is one of the things that we have to work on day in and day out. But um, when we are in that environment where it just really is all about the dunya, nothing can be more harmful to our deen than that. And this is the thing that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he worried about for his ummah, is that he worried is that the dunya would be opened up for his ummah, and that we would compete for it the way that people competed for it in the, those that came before us. And then it would destroy us the way that it would destroy them. And we do tend to forget as well that detaching from this world is one of the greatest overarching sunnahs of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as unpopular as it may be. And ultimately, the key to detachment of the dunya and the first stepping stone towards that is to make sure first and foremost that everything that we're doing is permissible. So by doing everything that is making that the first stepping stone, it's a type of zuhud because that you're leaving out and you're having zuhud in the things that are impermissible. It's a type of zuhud. You're leaving certain things out that, okay, I'm not doing those things. I'm going to make sure that it fir first step is that I'm within the realm of what is permissible. And you'd be surprised. Some of the restaurants that we go to are questionable. Some of the places we take our children are questionable. Definitely a lot of what it, we watch on the television or on our devices is really questionable, if not outright haram. So let's start with zuhud and the things that are impermissible. And just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. And just because there's not a lot of good, creative, permissible options, likewise doesn't make it right. It makes it challenging, but it doesn't make it right. So we can't provide alternatives that are permissible, whether it be proper books that teenagers should be reading, anyone that knows a teenager, that you're trying to get them off a device, you're trying to encourage them to read, but then what on earth do you have them read? Because reading arguably, and reading bad books, and most of what's out there, that teenagers tend to read in our time, whew, I don't know if you've all looked at some of the pages your own kids are reading, it's scary, that reading has a more powerful impact, arguably, than even watching videos, which has a terrible impact upon you. It affects you in a much deeper way. And so that if our children are reading books that are like, it's like consuming junk food, but they're reading junk literature, the way that junk food, what that does to the physical body, this is doing to their spirit and doing to their heart. So the, it is very difficult to find good books for them to read. However, it doesn't mean that we just open up the floodgates for them. We still have to try. And it is frustrating because you can't micromanage the lives of your teenagers. And you're busy, you have your own life. And realistically, we know how much time we're spending on a daily basis with our kids anyway. It's not much. So how do you cover and how do you oversee everything that is that they're exposed to? How do you walk them through the ideas they're being inundated with from the time that they're in school from a young age? And even if we're homeschooling, even if we're in Islamic schools, these things still reach our children. And that we have to spend time with them and discuss this, their ideas and to give them clarity on certain matters to the extent possible. There is no way around this. Anyhow, um, we have to look for alternatives. So this is the first step, is let's just have zuhud and try to have zuhud in what we know we shouldn't be doing. And then we can move up after that in the various degrees of this. So the people that we bring close, these are the five traits that we really want them to have. Now. Now we're going to look at what Mukhtar Holland covers uh, in his translation of this section. And um, he will mention here uh, what he calls the Hukuk al wa suhba the eight duties, if you will, of brotherhood. And again, that I feel that it's best that we present this material as Imam Ghazali presents it. And then we see where we fit. And we recognize where we are and where we need to be. 
and we develop a plan on how to get there. And again, the principle states is that just because you can't attain all of something, it doesn't mean that you completely leave it either. And this is the nature of the nafs. It either wants to fully have something or it doesn't want to have any part of that thing. It's very hard for the nafs to be balanced. And that's why it's so hard for the nafs to have a schedule. That's why it's so hard for the nafs to that worship when it's time to worship and to sleep when it's time to sleep and to that work hard when it's time to work hard and study when it's time to study and to that spend time with people when it's time to spend with people. Hakadah. That ultimately we're multitasking in our lives in terms of the things that we do on a daily basis. The nafs wants to do what it wants to do, when it wants to do it, and how it wants to do it to the amount that it wants to do it. And it's very important that we put everything in its proper place. And ultimately, just because that we enjoy doing something doesn't mean that that is the only thing that we have to do. We have to look at the responsibilities that are upon our shoulders. And thus the wisdom of the famous statement of Imam Madik when he was asked about focusing on ilm and study. And he said that there's no doubt that seeking sacred knowledge is a beautiful thing, but look at the responsibilities that Allah Ta'ala has placed upon your shoulders. So in other words, that knowledge is a part of our life to various degrees. There are people that can feed themselves up to be lifelong, full-time learners. But then, other people have other responsibilities. So, just because they're not a full-time learner doesn't mean that you don't spend time learning. We should at least spend the, a little bit of time daily learning. Every one of us should have a book that we are reading at all times. One book. At least have one book that you're reading at all times. You don't have to necessarily finish it in one week, but have something you're reading. In addition to the news articles that you're reading on your phone or Time Magazine or your Facebook feed or all that type of stuff. Okay, you're already doing that and you know you're gonna likely do that. In addition to that, have an actual book, right? And preferably not a Kindle, an actual book that you can smell and have these beautiful experiences with even 10 years later and read your notes. And I have this book here. I don't even know who gave this to me, but someone quoted this beautiful thing here. Every morning there is, uh, there is a shout, O son of Adam, this is a new day. It is the witness of your actions. O son of Adam, you're just days. Every time a day goes, a portion of you goes. By Allah, I met a people who were more vigilant uh, over how they spent their time than you over you are, your dinars and dirhams, Hassan al-Basri. So you have like these notes in your books. And then you have books that like from like previous times where like there's books from Mauritania that still have sand in them or that you got like a little bit of like etar perfume on them that still like kind of smell the same way. And then you have like your notebooks that you kept that brings back the nostalgia of kind of the, the setting to that particular benefit that you received. And so that actually have a physical book and that have a way where you can write in it in, in different ways. Because the, the more you read, the more your mind is sparked to think about other ideas. And you might have something that you write in the back of the book, and then something then that you want to research, and that book will lead you to another book. But just have one book. And there is a long list of uh, beneficial types of books that you can read. And um, one additional suggestion is, if you want to have one book that you're reading at a time, that you're reading from beginning to end, I would recommend having a book on tasawwuf, Sufism, purification of the heart, that you put by your nightstand, that you read every single day, even if it's one paragraph. And I would start with a book like The Beginning of Guidance of Imam Ghazali, and then I would move after that to a book like The Book of Assistance of Imam Haddad, and then I would move after that to another book of Imam Ghazali uh, that also Sheikh Mukhtar Hawan translated. Uh, the path of the worshippers, and so forth and so on. I would read Purification of the Heart, uh, the translation of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and there's about four or five other books that relate to the science of the heart that you should put this book by your nightstand and read every single day, even if it's one paragraph or a single page, because of the importance of this science. And then when you finish one book, you move to the other. You finish that book, you move to the other. And you'd be surprised and how much knowledge you could learn on a regular basis with very small little things. Uh, that 
Said Amjad, he speaks to me so much about atomic habits. I actually heard the uh, podcast of uh, the author who wrote the book, and I was like, man, that reminds me of Said Amjad, even though it was the man's ideas. But anyhow, atomic habits is a really cool idea, and the whole idea is, is that human beings are people of habit. We all have habits, and ultimately, you are what your habits are. And one of the things that he says there, the greatest way to help yourself change habits is to create an environment that is conducive to certain habits. So he says that if you want to read more, place books in different places around your house. Make them easy to access. And the remote control, put it somewhere far away, like put it you know, in the closet or something where you have to go out of your way to actually get the remote control, put your iPad or whatever somewhere that's locked away in the closet. Make it difficult to access. And then the essence of the idea of atomic habits is read for two minutes. Sit down and read for two minutes. And then stop. And he mentions that he knew someone, the author of the book, that wanted to get him so he wanted to lose weight and get in shape. So he said he drove to the gym every single day for three weeks and did five minutes of exercise in the gym and then went home. Even though he eventually wanted to stay, he wanted to develop the habit of going to the gym. And then you increase it after that. And you will see this works. This works. It's very real. Because you get attached very easily. You read two minutes and then like you get into it, you're like, I wanna keep reading, but put the book down. You'll then wanna come back, just two more minutes. You wanna come, and then you eventually can uh, expand it after that. So that we need to bring this into our lives. So let's look at what he says here, بِذْنِ دَهِ تَعَالَى Naam, about the حقوق الصُحْبَة and the very first one that he mentions is in relation to our wealth, of course. Because as Sadaqatu Burhan, your wealth is a proof, a proof of the reality of our faith, whether we really believe or not. And he says here, in relation to the degrees of material support, so this is relation to our brothers. If we're really going to say that this is our brother for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, there are degrees. So he says here, the lowest degree is where you place your brother on the same footing as that someone that is working for you, attending to his need from your surplus. Some need be false, and when you have more than you require to satisfy your own, so you give spontaneously, not obliging him to ask. To oblige him to ask is the ultimate shortcoming in brotherly duty. So this is the lowest degree. This is the lowest degree. At the second degree, you place your brother on the same footing as yourself. You are content to have him as partner in your property and to treat him like yourself to the point of letting him share it equally. And Hassan said that there once was a man who would split his waistband between himself and his brother. At the third degree, no, and the waistband here is how he translated izar. At the third degree, the highest of all, you prefer your brother to yourself and set his need before his, your own. This is the degree of the Siddiq in the final stage for those united in spiritual love. So in other words, the first thing is in relation to our wealth. And alhamdulillah, in general, Muslims are an incredibly generous community. And anyone that has experienced people outside of the Muslim community can testify to this. Muslims are very generous by their nature. And they tend to give out a lot of wealth and support a lot of projects. And this is a very beautiful thing and that this is a very blessed thing. And as people develop a closer and closer relationship though, 
there is more of a responsibility when it comes to this. And there are people, subhanAllah, that have these true traits of chivalry. One of the things that touched my heart, subhanAllah, there's people that are still like this in this world. That I saw a video that uh, Shaykhana, the son of Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya, uh, he was, went to visit uh, Osama, uh, not knowing, and Shaykh Hamza mentioned this in his obituary, not knowing that Osama had passed away. He left Rabat, Morocco, it's about a three, three and a half hour drive to Fez, and went to go visit Osama, and Osama had passed in the meantime. So he was there for the burial, and after he was buried, is that the video is available online. As he said his name, he says that I'm Shaykhana, that the son of Abdullah Bayya. And he says that, that I'm making you all witnesses, that his debts are my debts. And he said, his children are like my children, and I will look after them like my own as long as I'm alive. Allahu Akbar. This is rujula. This is true manhood. This is futuwa. This is chivalry. The type of people that would do this. There was a relationship between them and that he felt part of that relationship means for me, my brother is dead, his debts are my debts, I'm taking care of him. Khalas. And he, it's not lip service. He'll do that. He'll remain faithful to that. And on top of that, his children are like my children until the day that I die. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is how true people are. And this is how we need to be. If one of us would go, that those of us that have children, what would you want people to do for you if you were gone? Like what if no one took care of your children and just let this world that prey on them and everything we know that is that they're exposed to, all the difficulties they're going to go through, having lost their father, to help them you know, process and that get through the difficulties of being a young man or woman in our time and to grow up into maturity and to learn what you need to learn to that develop, relate, to have a relationship and to have children and to have a livelihood and to live how you're supposed to live and to do that without a parent. We all know how difficult that is. This is, this is subhanAllah. And we might be a person that can't do that for a hundred people but there might be two or three people that we might do that for. But if everybody would do that for a person or two or maybe three, then we would have enough support from within. And we wouldn't need people from the outside to help. But this is why this is so important. These, this, is, this is, subhanAllah, there's people that are still like this. So... There is a financial responsibility that we have towards our friends. And even though he says the, the lowest degree here is that we don't oblige him to ask. This is what he says is the ultimate shortcoming in the brotherly duty. We should be aware of our brother's situation from before that they fall into that situation. Now the problem is sometimes... Honorable people are, are good at hiding it. Honorable people sometimes are good at hiding it. So, what it means though is this should be on our radar. We should be people that are in tune with the way people are. And it's really, I've told the story on multiple occasions, but it's such a beautiful story. That Habib Ali narrates that he knows firsthand that his Sheikh, Habib Abdul Qadir bin Ahmed al Saqaf, received that from a businessman in Saudi Arabia, one million rials, which is roughly close to $300,000. And he says after Asr, he got in the car, and they went around from house to house in Jeddah, which is a huge, sprawling city, and he would instruct his driver, take this amount to this family, 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 this amount to this family, and oh, and on and on. Until well after Salat al Isha, he takes the bag and he lifts it upside down and he goes like this is Allahumma fashat. Oh Allah, bear witness. That bear witness that what? He distributed all of that wealth in a way that was pleasing to him and didn't keep a single real for his own self. Because he sought to begin with 
as Allah giving him that wealth to take care of other people. And like yeah, the, the story of our Prophet Sallallahu when Sayyid Ashim is that were you only to have left some from before us? Right? Another one of my teachers, his grandfather, Habib Ibrahim bin Umm bin Aqil, similar stories. This is the way the people of Allah are. And they didn't even have enough money to have a full dinner at night, and he distributed all of the wealth. This is the way they are. And obviously, that's a very high standard to be that selfless and to be that concerned for other people. But it leads, what, but what, the reason I mentioned that story is he was aware of who the poor people were. He wasn't disconnected from his society. He was aware. And this is the problem of the suburban, urban, one of the many problems of us just living these comfortable lives in the suburbs and not being aware of other people's realities. But there's people even in the suburbs that are struggling. But we have to even more so in our particular context go out of our way to get out of our ivory towers to be in touch with the people and to be aware of the needs of the people. And if we can do it firsthand, that's even better. But if not, we should have people that are letting us know who are doing the work for us so at least we're aware secondhand how people are doing. And this is the way that the people before us were. They would actively check up on people. We know Sayyidina Umar would walk through the streets at night. And we know his concern was not only for people, is that a donkey would trip because he didn't pave a road in the way that they paved roads back then, that he would be asked about that, why didn't you pave this road? They worry about donkeys tripping up in places well outside of Medina, right? Let alone that people. So these are beautiful meanings that have to become a part of our deen. And there's no way for us to be effective as Muslims in these societies without these types of things. We can talk all we want about Islam, but what's really going to touch people's hearts and change them is when they see Muslims living these meanings, where they find a qualitative difference by living next to a Muslim, by interacting with a Muslim, that a deen that is being put into practice, even if it's not perfect, the standards are so low, even the lowest degree, or even at somewhat approaching the lowest degree of implementation, is so much better than the alternative, this is attractive. And for those of us that know this, that, that for instance, the family structure in Islam, it is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. Even families that, for Muslim standards, are not the closest knit families, not the closest of knit families. It's so much better than your typical family nowadays. It really impacts you. That impacted me greatly. That impacted me greatly in everywhere I went, but especially the time that I spent in Damascus in seeing the incredibly beautiful way that Syrian mothers were with their families. And I was blessed to be around this very beautiful family. And it was just really beautiful, really amazing to see this. And I was just like, if people only saw like how beautiful this really is. Anyhow, there is a financial responsibility that we have. And we need to do our best. And my personal advice is, I'm not, I don't really like fundraisers personally, but if someone tells you about some type of cause, at very least, well, first of all, the etiquette is to be thankful that Allah made you aware of a good cause or someone in need. To be thankful that Allah made you aware of a cause or someone in need. Because the Sadiheen used to see people knocking on the door to beg as people being sent by Allah for means for them to draw near to him through charity. This is the etiquette that we should have. And then the second etiquette is, support that cause in the way that you can, even if it's with a single dollar. Give what you have. Make your intention at least, well sorry, three stages. Be happy that Allah made you aware of it. Two, make the intention to support every good cause on the face of this earth. And three, do what you can for all of the different causes that you come across even if it means only supporting it with a dollar. And there might be some that are closer to your heart that you want to support a little bit more, and that's perfectly fine. And there's a wisdom in why Allah moves certain hearts to support certain causes. There's a wisdom in that. 
And alhamdulillah, from the bounty of Allah, there's enough to go around. But this is important so that we change the frame as opposed to that, oh, here we go again. Mashallah, the next that, uh, fundraiser that I have to go and sit through and they're going to trap me until they get my money and then serve me dinner at the end, right? But we should be happy in general to support what we can. So there's a financial responsibility. The second duty relates to helping our brother and that he translates it here as to render personal aid and the satisfaction of needs attending to them without waiting to be asked and giving them priority over private needs. It's a little bit ambiguous there, but taking care of their needs. Now, that taking this up before they even ask and giving the needs of your brother preference over your own needs. And so, um, we all need people to help us with things in this world. And especially in our time, things are difficult. Sometimes you have to ask people to do certain things for you. But you have to be careful about who you ask to do what for you. And there's some people that, of course, might take advantage of that. Uh, but outside of those, those situations where people are taking advantage, which they really shouldn't, and that approach or actually end up on the verge of some form of abuse, put that aside, and we don't mean put that aside, that we neglect that, that happens, and that's wrong. But there are times where we're going to be in need of people. There are times when you need help. Sometimes you need someone to help pick up your parents from the airport because you can't do it. And what are you going to do? Get your parents to come home in a taxi? Right? There's times where you need help to do certain things. And this is where we need friends who are willing to help and are happy to help and are actually feel honored that you ask them to help. And ideally that we eventually have relationships where we don't even need them to ask. And so it's a very low level of brotherhood if we're asked to help in a particular situation and then we grudgingly say, oh, okay. Or outwardly we're like, oh yeah, sure. But inwardly we're like, oh, right. I'm going to be in the car for three hours, right? So brotherhood requires that we step up when it comes to this if it truly is brotherhood. Now, uh, there are certain things that are considered to be fard kifaya, that are communal obligations, that if you don't fulfill them, the entire community is sinning. That's not what we're talking about here. That relates to the rights. We're talking about now beyond that. Beyond that where it's not a matter of doing something that is not permissible. So there are degrees. And then he says here, the lowest degree consists in attending to the need when asked and when in plenty, though with joy and cheerfulness, showing pleasure and gratitude. That is the lowest degree. So we're going to repeat that. Now, so, Al-Qiyam bil haja and al-Sawar al-Qudra, walakin ma al-Bashasha wal istibshar, wa idhar al-Farah, wa qabul al-Minna. So attending to the need, helping them take care of their need. And when in plenty, and when you're able to, is that though with joy and cheerfulness. So you might not be able to, if you, if you can't do something, خلاص, you're obviously not going to be taking account for that. But joy and cheerf cheerfulness. And you have idhar al-farah, that you show that you're actually happy about this. And qabul al-minna, that you see the minna is not you upon them. They have a minna that upon you. So that this is really one of the big ones that all of us fall into all of the time. And we tend to forget that reminding someone of some good that we've done for them is haram. We forget that. And this is a big one. In all different types of relationships, husbands and wives and wives and husbands and that parents and children and children and parents and brothers with brothers and sisters, with, like this is a big one. Something all of a sudden goes on, it's like, doesn't this person realize what I just did for them? Right? And then we remind them of it. This is a problem and it nullifies the reward of everything that we've done. 
And it's hard because sometimes you want to say something like, you just got to bite your tongue and just bear it. And sometimes people were totally ungrateful. You went out of your way. And if you did it for a lot, it's preserved for you. Don't worry. But sometimes we just about to lash out because we're like, no, this person is doing that after that. We got to be very careful there. So this is the lowest degree. And then the degree after that is where we reach a point where we preempt the needs of the various people that we're interacting with and we don't even make them be in need of asking us. And there's a lot of details that, that he mentions here that unfortunately we're going to have to skip over. So then we have the third right, which now this one relates to the tongue. And Imam Ghazali says here is that uh, is where we refrain from mentioning their faults in their presence and behind their backs. Bal yatajahalu anhu. Rather, a tajahal is that we act like we are ignorant of them. And we remain silent and don't uh, necessarily that return in speech and respond to various things that are said. So again, all of these things need to be put in context. And there are certainly certain things that your brother would do that might not be right, that it's not just a matter of it being a fault, but it relates to harming another person. That brotherhood or sisterhood doesn't mean that we just let people do those things. Uh, no, that people should be, that spoken to in a very gently, in a very gentle way, or implicitly before being explicit about the matter. Um, and then there's stages that we go through before we reach the point of, okay, I might have to distance myself from this person a little bit because this person continues to do such and such a thing. But in general, all people that we know have faults. And the context of what Imam Ghazali is saying are the faults that don't relate to the harming of other people. Okay? So that if we know one of the people that is close to us isn't the most generous of people, okay? we're patient with that. Even though it's good to find friends that are generous, but we're patient with that. And we don't talk about that trait that they have. If we know that they are impatient, if we know they have some other type of issue that they're going through, some type of struggle that they have. Again, as long as it's not affecting someone else, you veil them. And you don't talk about those things in their presence or uh, outside of their presence. And you simultaneously do the best that you can to help them through that particular thing. They might talk to you about it or they might not. So this is part of brotherhood. Is that restraining our tongue in the proper way, in the shari'i way. Just as that sometimes this requires us to speak about certain things. Part of brotherhood is speaking about other things. And we have to learn the nuance. And unfortunately, that in our day and age, I see a world of extremes. The very little that I'm on social media, I see a world of extremes. People are way over here or they're way over here. There's very few people that are balanced. And the people that try to be balanced are attacked, oftentimes by both sides. And it's like, okay, I just can't say anything then, right? Because no matter what you say, there's going to be someone that pokes a hole in what it is that you're saying. And, um, and some, sometimes it's completely without right. And other times that there might be a legitimate concern or pain in relation to that. Nevertheless, it is important that we have balance in all of these different affairs. So there are times that we need to, to speak and there are times that we need to remain silent. And then the next one here is, and this is the fourth duty, is to use the tongue for speaking out. So this is now a separate duty, even though it also relates to the tongue. And he says here, just as brotherhood calls for silence about unpleasant things, 
so it requires the utterance of favorable things. Indeed, this is more particularly a feature of brotherhood because anyone satisfied with silence alone might as well seek the fellowship of the people of the graves. You wish for brothers so as to benefit by them, not just to escape by being hurt by them. And the point of silence is to avoid hurt. So the point of silence is to avoid hurt. So what he says here is, is that now there's certain things that it is that we have to say. And our Prophet clearly told us, If one of you loves his brother, let him know that you love him. And there's a number of different things that we can do. And so he mentions them here. Is that um, if you know that something has happened to someone, they got a new job, or they got married, or they had a child, or something of this nature, part of brotherhood is to congratulate them and share in their joy. And that also, uh, if um, that something bad happened to them, is that you should be there for them and say that you're sorry for their loss. If you know someone is sick, that you send them a text saying that that person is in our prayers. And if it relates to that brother, you're reaching out to him or her, if it's a sister and saying that you'll be in our prayers and so forth and so on. So there are certain things that we have to do in relation to our tongue. And um, there's a long list of those things, so we'll just keep it general at this point for time's sake, because we are down to about five minutes, unfortunately. So using our tongue for good purposes, and I recommend that everybody uh, get this, and every, anything that we're missing here, that you can, you know, read inshallah ta'ala uh, in detail. And then the fifth is al-afu an al-zallat wal-hafawat is forgiveness of mistakes and failings. And even though there is, there are details in relation to this conversation, this is a very important trait. We have to be people that forgive. And we all have shortcomings. And just as we want people to overlook our shortcomings, we have to overlook other people's shortcomings. And sometimes it might take a little bit of time. Give yourself the time that you need to heal. Don't try to, if you have a gaping wound, that do what you normally do. Let the wound heal and then get back to what you were doing. Give it a little bit of time. That in relation to forsaking your brother, a prophet even gave us three days to let the emotions settle. Khalas, right? Less than three days, you don't have to speak to your brother. You're mad at them for whatever reason, you don't have to seek, speak to them. Let it settle, and then khalas, make sure it doesn't go past three days. Don't forsake them beyond that. And then even beyond that, if you just at least send salams, then khalas, you're not falling into the sin of forsaking your brother. Look at how practical and beautiful the sharia is. It gives you time to process these things as human beings. So don't force yourself to do something you're not ready to do. Allow yourself the time that you need to heal. And if they're pushing you for some reason to heal, no, don't let them do that. That, that time needs to transpire before we do that. But we have to be open to forgiveness. And people will fall short, we're human beings, we make mistakes. We have all different types of issues that we're ourselves dealing with, that we might be especially stressed out in a particular time, but likewise the other person. So if we're going to have bonds of brotherhood, we have to be open to doing this. And then the sixth right is, relates to that praying for our brothers. A dua Fi hayatihi wa ba'da mamatihi. Allahu Akbar. Is that the sixth duty is to pray for your brother during his life and after his death. That he may have all might wish that he may have all he might wish for himself, his family, and his dependents. And this doesn't mean that you just do it one time. This is a part of your daily practice. There are people that make dua for their loved ones by name in detail every single day. And if you develop a list, that's perfectly fine too. And then anyone you don't mention specifically, you can mention generally. But this is a beautiful thing. Every single day we should be doing this. Praying there. And imagine, look at the beauty here. Imagine if you have all of these different people 
in different parts of the world that are brothers or sisters for Allah's sake, praying for each other, and you have angels that are that saying, وَلَكَ مِثْرُ and you have the same, and that dua is mustajab because it's not about it's not for you, it's for him. So you know that they're answered. Allahu Akbar. Like look at the beauty of this whole thing. Right? And it is for this reason one of them said, were it not to be for brothers that I had for Allah's sake, I wouldn't have wanted to remain here in this world. Because it's such an opportunity to let draw near to Allah Ta'ala and reach the highest degrees of closeness to Him. And then the seventh duty is al wafa wal ikhlas loyalty and sincerity. Allahu Akbar. And that what it means here in terms of wafa as sabat al al hub wa idamatu il al mot ma is that you remain firm upon continual love that you have for this individual until death. And then after death, in relation to his children and his friends. And look what Imam Ghazali says. فَإِنَّ الْحُبْ إِنَّمَا يُرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ Love is only desired for this hereafter. In other words, you only truly, truly benefit for it in the hereafter. And Allahu Akbar. This is how we should be. There's very few pe people have forgotten this. We don't live in a society that teaches us this virtue. We live in a society that teaches us to be narcissistic and selfish. These are the virtues that we need. Where we are people of wafa. Even if the relationship went a little bit sour, you should never, ever, ever forget what people have done for you. Even if the relationship went a little bit sour, Never, ever, ever forget what people have done for you. What kind of person are you if you do? Allah put that person in your life for that reason. Even if it went a little bit sour. Okay. But still remain loyal in, to the degree that, it, it, that you should. So loyalty and sincerity. And that he goes into the, a lot of beautiful details here about... Uh, what this means but loyalty to the brother includes consideration of that all of the people that are connected to him and all of the people that are related to him his friends and his relatives and so forth and so that when you love someone naturally you're also concerned for people that are associated with them and then the last trait in closing here is relief from discomfort and inconvenience. At-takhfif wa tark at wa taklif So you should not discomfort your brother with things that are awkward for him. And there's a lot of details here, but I'm just going to summarize for time's sake. This gets back to where we were talking about the one to ten. And you have to have a realistic knowledge of where you're at with any particular person. Don't force them to be at a level that they're not ready for. And don't fault them for not being at a higher level. Be content with where they're at. And thank Allah that at least it's at a level 3. And then thank Allah for the other brother that you have that's at a level 7. But if you focus someone who's at 3 to be at 7, you're going to lose the relationship. And that's what's called tekallaf. You're forcing something that's not really there. Do what you need to do to build that relationship. And then maybe it will grow from a 4 to a 5 and so forth. And then with the people that are seven, that make sure you fulfill the conditions so that it doesn't drop to like a five or a four. But keep it real when it comes to this. And know where you're at and know your limits. And be honest with your brother like, I would love to, but I'm just not there. And it's better just to be honest. Is that then to say that you're going to do something and not do that particular thing. Just be honest. And be transparent. And that if people aren't willing to accept you with your honesty as you are, then they're not really able to be your brother or sister for an extended period of time. People have to accept you as you are. And if they expect you to be something else, you can never ever really have a good and solid relationship with them. Um, I hope there's been some benefit here. Uh, I feel that we did a very inadequate job of presenting uh, what needed to be presented. We only had a short period of time, but Again, back to the same principle we mentioned, it's better to do a little bit than to completely, uh, that to not to do anything at all. So we hope that's been a benefit. 
And this is a conversation that we need to return to time and time again. And inshallah ta'ala, if we have heard that it's a benefit, may Allah ta'ala make it a reality within us and what it is that we didn't cover in this book, that from the blessing of doing what we can, may Allah ta'ala bless us also to put that into practice. And may these realities become come to life in our own selves, in our families, and with amongst our loved ones, and in the communities, and amongst the ummah of our Prophet Wasallam, and to manifest and to be a means for us to attain the greatest good in this world and the next, and to there be a means and source of spreading the lights of guidance of this blessed religion to all of those that we are living with in this country. May Allah Taala give us tawfiq in all of our different prayers. Ya Alhamdulillah Rahmin, and to forgive us of all of our sins and to keep us together and bless us to have beautiful, loving relationships solely for our sake. Taala Taala, Allah Taala preserve these moments that we spend together and bless us to have an everlasting reward for them that increases eternally. Ya Alhamdulillah Rahmin, may Allah Taala keep us all together in this dunya and in the barzakh and in the akhirah. May not a single person ever be left behind. Ya Alhamdulillah Rahmin, may Allah Taala bestow a mercy upon us, a comprehensive and mercy whereby which all of our sins are forgiven Ya Rahman all of our needs are taken care of and we attain everything that is that we want in this world and in the next may Allah Ta'ala bless this beautiful community and bless all of us inshallah Ta'ala and all of our children and all of our loved ones Ya Rahman may we be people who that turn to him in all of our different states subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask Allah to bless us with a deep and profound love of him and of his blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and all of his inheritors until Yawm Al-Qiyamah Ya Rahman Rahmin bless us to love them and to follow their footsteps and to be with them in the dunya and the barzakh and the akhirah wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen bin sirrasul al-fatiha